Hey, everybody, welcome to the Addiction Unlimited podcast, where you get to learn everything you want to know about addiction and recovery. I'm your host, Angela Pugh, co founder of Kansas City Recovery, life coach, and recovering alcoholic. To learn more about me, you can listen to episode zero on your podcast app or find us on the web at addictionunlimited.com. Hello, my friend. Welcome to episode number 209 of the Addiction Unlimited podcast. I'm your coach, Angela Pugh, life coach, recovering alcoholic, and entrepreneur. And this is a coaching podcast. No matter what you're recovering from, whether it's alcohol, drugs, food, maybe it's a divorce or the loss of a job or an illness. We're all recovering from something, and that's what we talk about here. You get a front row seat to hear about all my drama and trauma and (laughs) how I've overcome the obstacles and all the mistakes I've made so I can tell you what works and what doesn't. I'm super excited about today's episode, you guys. This is one of those really important ones to me because it is one of our listeners. And you know, I love doing this, bringing our people on the show so we can put faces with names from the Facebook group and all that stuff. And any of you that are in the Sober Society membership community, you will definitely know this guy because he shows up to all of our online meetings, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them. (laughs) And he's been around with us for a long time. And I want to give you a little backstory of why this particular conversation is really exciting for me. Because you guys may not know when I'm in the Facebook group with you and I'm commenting on your posts and we're having conversations, like that is legitimately me. I do have a team that moderates the Facebook group, right? Like if you post a link or you are advertising yourself or something or pulling people away to something, your posts are probably going to get removed, right? Like I have moderators and you have to. And also Facebook will remove things. So I do have moderators, but when I'm interacting with you, it is legitimately me. So in the Facebook group, you guys hear me overly bragging all the time about our Facebook group. It's such a wonderful community and so much support in there. And this is a person who I started to see, it's been a while, (laughs) and I started to see him really showing up in our group and interacting with people. And he had a lot of great wisdom. And then I saw him in the Sober Society online meetings, and I got to actually meet him, which just made it even better. And when he wanted to come on the show, I was super excited. So this is Curry T. Bird. This is one of the best recovery conversations I think I've had on this podcast where we dig into everything. (laughs) We dig into AA and not AA and what we like about it and what we don't like about it. We dig into all the terminology and, you know, the different names that people want to call themselves in this journey and if it's important, if it's not important. And we disagree on some things. And that's something I really want you to hear because you hear me talk all the time about it's okay to disagree. If we have a difference of opinion, it doesn't mean we're on opposing teams. We're not against each other. We all have our own views, and I loved hearing Curry's views, and I think you guys are going to love a lot of his points of view as well. So I'm super stoked to bring this conversation to you. Let's listen to Curry Teeper. Mr. Curry, welcome to the show. I'm so grateful that you wanted to come on and have some conversation with me. You have been such an incredible, valuable member of our Facebook group that I'm always bragging about. We have the greatest people in there and the best conversations and support and love. So I'm super happy that you were on here having this conversation with me. Why don't you take a quick minute and just tell everybody a little bit about you and what you do? Okay. Well, it, the honor's mine, Angela. I'll, I'll tell you that. And what you do with your group is uh, nothing short of amazing. Um, and and I'm just, I just can't say that enough. Uh, me, uh, just a regular guy, uh, quit drinking back on July the 20th of 1997. 
coming up on 25 years this year, which is pretty cool. Very cool. Um, um, we have a, a, I help co-found a, a nonprofit organization called the Freedom Through Choice Foundation, which is remind humanity of the most valuable gift that they have, and that is free will choice. The power that that uh, entails and, and what it means to be an empowered human being on this planet. Um, because it's that's that's we were sitting around and it's just sort of a little bit of a I'll shoot off here a minute. You got to watch me. But we were sitting around one day and we said, what is it? You know, my, my partner and I and said, what can we give humanity that cost absolutely nothing that everybody needs? And we thought about choice. That's when the Freedom Through Choice Foundation idea was born. We're still we're still getting going. I mean, it's just sort of it's like, like like lots of things. You sort of plant the seed and get it moving. We get, you know, the website's there and all those good things. And then just started a podcast off of after I heard you, I, you're one of the first podcasts that I that I started to listen to. And I've been thinking about podcasting for a bit. Uh, and it's a lot of work. I don't see how you do it. Um, <laughs> it is a lot of work. I feel like people don't understand that. It is a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but, but we're really just, uh, the foundation is just something that's really dear to my, to my partner. She's worked so hard on that. And, and we just knowing the power involved with your choice, one choice could change your life in so many ways. Mm, uh, you yeah. know, and so, and mindfulness and all this, you, you know, about all those things. And um, other than that, I'm just a human being and wanting to be a better person every day, Angela, just a regular guy. Okay, this sounds really interesting. So I want to dig into your foundation a little bit more and understand what is your foundation? What do you offer? I mean, what what will people find when they go there? Because this is fantastic. Free, freedom through choice. Amazing. Because so many people don't understand the level of choice they really have in every area of their life. Right. Now that's my spin on choice. I don't know if that's what you guys mean and what you're doing. So give us a little more insight into what the foundation does and what, what someone will find when they go there. There's a lot of material there. Yeah, our website is just there it's for, for free. You know, we've got a freedom from addiction, which is sort of my background. And we've got some pathways to wholeness, which are, you know, freedom from the blame game, mindfulness and forgiveness which are the three key things. There are workbooks there that are free. Uh, there are, are meditations that are there that are free that my, uh, my partner has done. It, it's like a lot of things. It started, the seed was planted. We put all this energy into manifesting this thing. Then life happens. You know, mm -hmm. you, and you, you drop back in. We've always kept the site up and, you know, and our hope is one day that, that, the right partner is going to see it <laughs> and we're going to say, you know, Hey, this is really cool because, you know, just, uh, just think about how humanity can change with one choice. And you know, this, you, you know, this better than anybody that I met in a long time. And so there's a lot of free stuff there. Good. What a great resource. And we'll share that in the show notes too. So everybody can go there and check it out and, and see what's available. It's, you know, one of the, most powerful lessons I learned from my sponsor pretty early in my sobriety was he used to always say, uh, life is seconds and inches, meaning that life isn't about the big things, the big milestones, your life happens in all those choices you make every inch of every step, every second of every day. That's what matters. It's seconds and inches. It's not the big profound things that we all think about. It's all the things we have to do to get to the very few big profound things we get to experience. Right. Yeah, it's... And that's the power of choice for sure, because we have a lot of decisions to make that affect the outcome. Any, any place that you find yourself at today, you know, you and I sitting here talking, you can trace it back as to a point to where you made a choice whether, you know, unconsciously or consciously that put you where you're at today. So in other words, your, your thoughts and your beliefs are creating your reality, uh, mm -hmm. which is what I believe uh, and, and have found to be true uh, and can look back and, and prove it out. Uh, everything that you see, no matter where you look, started out as a thought. 
it's a thought in the mind of, of a man or thought in the mind of God or woman. I mean, it's, it started out as someone's idea that yeah. put some energy behind this thought and manifested it into, into reality. And it's just, uh, that, that alone should be enough to sort of say, Hey, you know, I, I can control my destiny. I have something to say about which direction my ship goes. I'm not just yeah. riding on the, on the back, cleaning the deck. I'm, I'm, I'm the, I'm, I'm the person driving the boat and, uh, yeah, it's Amen just, to that. You, you forget too, right? You forget For you sure. got a choice. Yeah. Then you, you know, that look around my butts dragging and, uh, you know, I, I can't make it out of bed because like I'm here recently, I'm depressed because my, my dog, you know, we had to have our dog put to sleep. And, and so that was, uh, that was, uh, that was grueling and still is a little bit, but then I also have to look at the gifts that this, this special being gave me, uh, things that, that cannot be purchased that yeah. if you, if you could, the, the world would change overnight, you know, dogs, they don't, they, they don't need as much training as human beings they are natural, naturally good, good people. <laughs> most of them anyway. Yeah, I agree with that. I've learned so much from my dogs over the years, you know, so many valuable life lessons and patience and not being so controlling. And, you know, in my first year of sobriety, I had a guy and I've talked about this on the podcast before. There were three guys in my meeting when I first went to AA and I got sober at a noon meeting and I showed up every day. And there were these three guys that were my favorites, you know, and they all had very different styles. They all had really long-term recovery. And one of those guys, Jim J unfortunately passed from coronavirus. Um, he was such an important person in my journey in the beginning. And Jim J brought his dog to the meeting every day. And Jim J would take the steps and the principles of the program. And he would always relate them to these stories with his dog. You know, and and I loved that because I could connect with that. And that made sense to me. And it made a lot of the principles and the one-liners and all the sayings that are so overwhelming when you first go to 12-step meetings, because you don't understand all that stuff. And it made it make sense, right? For me. So I remember one day he was telling this story um, about copper, and he said, you know. Copper is not trying to control the outcome of every single thing that happens in his day. He said, when I tell copper to go get in the car, copper just gets in the car. Copper doesn't stop and say, where are we going? What are we doing? How long are we going to be gone? What do I need? He's like, he just goes and gets in the car. He's okay with it. You know, and every day he would have these stories and relating it to dogs. And it was such a blessing for me, you know, and I recognized it even in that moment because he was speaking in terms that I could understand. And it simplified the journey for me a lot in my first year, but it is just the power of dogs and how much comfort I felt showing up to the meeting every day and there being a dog there. Yeah. You know, I wish we could all bring our dogs to all the meetings. They but, go with the flow, yeah. man. They, they don't, yeah. uh, they don't judge things. They don't label things. They go right. with the flow. It's pure acceptance all the time. Dogs are just in acceptance. Like, okay, cool. Let me know. Where do I need to be? You picking me up or are you putting the leash on me? <laughs> like yeah. my dog is just like, whatever, dude, I'm with you. It's a hundred percent trust. And, and I make sure I never break that trust. You know, he knows he's, I've always got his back and vice versa, but yeah, they are, um, beautiful, beautiful lessons I've learned from getting to be a dog mom. Well, now we're talking about dogs. I'm gonna tell you about a dream I had when I first got sober. And this dream, it was sort of interesting. When I first got sober the first time, I stayed sober for 94 days. I went to AA and made 94 days to the day. And, and then I said, well, I'm just going to, I think at the time it was something I, that somebody wanted me to do. And I didn't want to do that. So that was enough to piss me off. And therefore, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy a six pack of beer. And there went the races. You know, when you, when you could drink a six pack of beer, tall boys and, and you know 35 40 minutes that's not your average speed so and so there I was back off to the races again but what i would do and one of the things i had learned about was that i would say i would ask a question to myself and i say it to myself my higher self 
to God, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call these things, uh, and, and a higher aspect of myself. And I would ask about a question about something, you know, should I do this or should I do that? Well, anyway, I used to go to these old juke joints, right? Back in the day where we'd go out and I mean, there would be these places are out in the middle of nowhere, man. And you get a beer 24 seven. It didn't matter when it was, but they were, you know, weren't legal. Right. But I go in this place and I'm in this dream and I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with start, you know, stopping drinking again. This is before I quit the second time for good. And I go in this old juke joint and all the guys around were playing pool and there's no telling what we're doing there. Right. And, and, and there's a dog that's on the floor. And this dog has got a piece of thread. Someone's taken a piece of thread, a needle and thread, and then weaved this thread through the skin of this dog. And the dog looked like it was in pain. And I reached down and I took the, I grabbed the string and I pulled the string out. And, and, and the dog just jumps up with such a sigh of relief with all this joy. And, and, and I, I quit not long after that, but that wasn't the main reason I did. But, but, but when that happened, the, the energy that was released there for me, and that was a gift, you know, that told me this is what I needed to do because I was thinking about drinking the beer. I had the beer were there. The tall boys were there and there's the dog, you know? And so it, 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 it just, um, it, there's so many things I can, I can say about that, but they've been a real big gift to me. And I, I didn't, um, my mother, I thought had, had given my dogs away when my dad passed back in the seventies and, uh, come to find out she didn't do that, <laughs> but I manifested that in my mind and had a resentment big enough to, to choke a meal with it. But, uh, but yeah, it's, um, recovery has been special to me. AA was, was very, very special to me. Uh, and I, I had met so many wonderful beings there. Uh, and I'm going to have an episode one day and talk about, talk about some of these folks because the gifts that they gave me are just absolutely beautiful. Um, and, and, and I took a different path in that regard too. Right. Uh, I haven't been to an AA meeting since 2002. I was in five years in AA religiously every, almost every day. And then I decided to, to take a different path and it, it set me on a course of a whole different, a different life. It was like a moving, like almost like a rite of passage. And so it, it, it was sort of, um, you know, the, the, the fear to leave AA was almost as big as the fear to go to AA and to, and to quit drinking. It was like a, For it was sure. like a milestone. Yeah. I don't know. It was weird, you know? And so, uh, well, I so appreciate that you share that too, because I think that there's a huge misconception and, and maybe it was, it was definitely more common in earlier years for sure. But I feel like people think when you go to a 12 step program and, and you become a part of that, that like you have to spend the rest of your life there. And that's not really the case. Some people do listen. My sponsor is still in a meeting probably close to every day. I would assume, you know, I mean, things changed certainly with coronavirus and meetings going online and things like that. But my sponsor is one of those people that even, I mean, when I met him, I was, he was 15 or 16 years sober. So now he's 30 plus years sober and he's just that guy. He will always be in meetings at that stage. When I got him, he was in multiple meetings every single day. He sponsored a ton of people and that was his lifestyle. But that doesn't mean that that's the quote unquote right way to do it or that we all have to do it that way. And I've had several periods of time that I've dipped out of the program. Not that I lose the knowledge or faith and belief in it, but just where I didn't go to meetings for a while. And then I go back and, you know, it's not something 
it's not a hotel California where you can check in, but you can't check out, you know, it's like you, and this goes back to even what you were saying in the beginning with the power of choice. These are your choices to make, right? Even in 12 steps, it's okay. If you don't want to do it exactly the way other people have done it, that's okay. Know that people are going to tell you what worked for them. And that's why they're going to recommend that way. But it doesn't mean you have to do it that way. You don't have to do it by the book. You have freedom of choice. You have your own self-determination. <laughs> you, you can choose how to do it. And I understand so well what you mean about like the fear of leaving. I remember, I think I was about two years sober And I realized that I had that fear. Like I had this fear of missing a day because I didn't miss a meeting my first five years. I was in at least one meeting every day. And and not that anybody made me do that or told me that's what I had to do, but because I loved it and it was a safe space for me and all my friends were there. I loved going there every day. But I remember around the two, two and a half year mark, I almost got resentful because I had this fear of missing a meeting. And I had this realization like, well, damn dude, if I don't go today, I'm not going to relapse tonight, you know, but I-, I had kind of thought that before, which was really a manifestation of my it's own fear. Yeah. And my own fear of how fragile my sobriety was, even though it wasn't like I had no desire to drink. I was really comfortable with that, but I definitely had a sense of like, I owed it to AA because that's what helped me put my life together. And, and I almost got a little resentful about it's it. Like, too, yeah, man. Like, Look, it's, yeah, it's sort of funny how we, we manifest these things. The, the AA program helped me to become a better human being. I didn't For really sure. have a roadmap. Right. Uh, yeah. And I've taken and, and all of these different things. That's why, yeah, you know, this when we started, you know, I come up with the idea for recovery my way. It's exactly what I meant is that I've taken all these different tools from all these different places that I've gone and different beliefs that I've, that I've, that I've uh, um, sort of journeyed into sometimes, not to stay, but taking these things and all these spiritual principles, whether it be AA or, or Buddhism or whatever, they're all intrinsically the same thing. It's the same thing. They're all the same thing. Same thing. Yes. That's what I wish people would get to about a, when people are like, you talk about the steps or it's religious or whatever. It's like, dude, these are all the same life lessons. It doesn't matter which thing you choose, whether it's life coaching, the freaking ancient Romans, the church of God, the Buddhist, the whatever. It is all the same teachings it's just be a good human <laughs> that's my that's my plan don't don't drink don't don't do any uh any any drugs and uh attempt to be a better human being than i was yesterday and these things you know you of course you've got extremism too right and you For people sure. do things to the book sometimes that's good yeah. you know the whole the whole powerless thing comes up that that came into play you know i had to realize i had to first believe this is my thing I had to first believe that I was, or think that I was powerless to know that I was not to learn that. So that fear was a healthy fear to, to, to know that I'm not powerless over anything outside of me, you know, as far as how I think about it. But then I realized I wasn't. So, but during that time in, in AA, I had a fear. If I didn't go to a darn meeting, I was going to go get, I was going to get drunk. And that was a fear right. that, I mean, that belief inside of that paradigm, it's, it's, it's there, it's present people. I mean, and, and you've got different types of drinkers and different levels sure. of people that abuse things at different levels. And you, you got a big egg basket there, uh, with a lot yeah. of different <laughs> stuff in there. And so, you, but I've taken all those things and I'll take little tidbits of them, Angela, and, and some of them fit me and some of them feel good to me. And so if it feels good, I'll do it. If it doesn't feel good, I, I don't stick with it anymore. You know, if, it, if my gut tells me yeah. to, to move on, I move on. 
Well, and people get pretty hung up to, because, you know, we're all pretty codependent and things like that, certainly in early sobriety or active addiction. And we get very hung up in what people are going to think about us and, you know, what will it look like if I don't do it the way they tell me? And am I going to be a bad AA or if I don't do it exactly the way people tell me? And the truth is it, it's your choice. How you want to do it is a hundred percent up to you. But it's up to you also to find the people that you connect with that have that same opinion. And that might take some time, right? But just like you're saying, I I did a lot of things against the grain in AA. I did a couple of really big things against the grain. The thing is, you can't be hung up on what people are going to think about you and want to be different. You know, you have to get okay with those things. If I'm going to do things differently and go against the grain, I have to get okay with some people are going to have an opinion about that. That isn't great. You can't have it both ways, you know? So it is, you can make the choice to do it however you want. Other people in the room are also just making their choice to do it how they want and they're allowed to talk about it and tell you about it. doesn't mean they're trying to control you, but yeah, there are just these weird sort of misconceptions about what it all means. And, and I think too, in the last 10 years, for sure, I think it's loosened a lot because the landscape of alcoholism and drinking over drinking and addiction, like all of that stuff has changed also And I think 12 steps have had to come around a little bit, but you're always going to have purists, you know, or extremists. You're always always going to have those, those people in every room, regardless of where you are or what organization it is. I mean, you've been sober a while. Look how long it takes you to understand that, right? When you first started, you didn't know that. I didn't know that. No, but I I knew, but I knew that I was okay making my own decisions. And I knew that I was okay to put people back in their lane if they tried to really infringe on my lane. You know, like I was very open. I was not unkind, but I, I had people had a lot of opinions, especially when I got my sponsor because I had a male sponsor. And that is a huge no, no. You're not supposed in to do program. that. That's not the rest. You're not, not supposed right. to do that. Right. I had all kinds. It's just what worked for me. Now, listen, at this stage of the game, knowing what I know now, I absolutely understand why it's a big no, no, but that took over a decade <laughs> of being in those rooms and being in recovery, being a sober person, doing this as work, studying this in school. Like that took a lot for me to understand like, oh, okay, I get it now. That's not the best choice. I would never recommend it for somebody else. I just know it's what worked for me. And when I had people that really wanted to get in my business and be unkind about it, because I definitely did. And, you know, there were a couple of women in my group that were like the guru sponsors of my group. And they were both pretty irritated that I didn't join their thing, whatever, Mm -hmm. their little clan of sponsees. You know, they were pretty irritated that I didn't want to be on their team. And it's not that I didn't want to be on their team. I didn't, I, I didn't even think about their team, but they were not happy with my choice to have a male sponsor. And, and I took some shit for it. There's no question. The difference is I was okay to say, you know what? I really appreciate your thoughts. Thank you for sharing that with me. Like I get where you're coming from. This is the choice I'm making for me. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have a problem doing that. Most people aren't that comfortable, right? Most people are way more caught up in, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to make any trouble. I don't want them to think badly about me. So again, it's the same thing. Like if you're going to make the choice to be different, you have to be okay with getting some pushback for being different. Yeah. I had, I had male and female, several, and I didn't really have anybody that was official Mm because I already knew what I was going to do. I knew I wasn't Mm going to drink. That's the only thing I really needed to know. That is the only thing Curry had to figure out that he just couldn't drink anymore. Everything else is just, you know, struggle. Do you make it right? But I, these people had different perspectives. I had a guy, this guy, Ron B. And Ron said, you know, Curry, and I, I was a little bit different when I got sober. I mean, it's just like something happened. I, you know, the, the, the day of my, when I quit drinking, 
And the next day when I woke up that next day, it's never been the same. It's never been the same. Yes. And, and so I didn't fit this, that stereotypical mold either. Cause I re- I came in and I read, I was reading every kind of book, every spiritual book, everything, but the damn big book. Right. And so I'm, I'm reading and I'm just sucking all this stuff up. Cause I'm like, at least it's like a part of me is just expanding that I didn't know was there, you know? And so he said, you know, he says, here's, he said, once you figure out Curry that you can't drink, there's another world out there. He said, that's the only thing you've got to figure out is that you can't drink. That's it. He said, that's it. And, 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 and I never forgot that. And I, I had so many different teachers and I have different people now that have nothing to do with, like I said, I, I don't, I, you listening to your podcast got me back into thinking about recovery. I'm not a part of that community, you know? Um, and, and now I, I, I'll admit, I judge myself about that when that first happened. Um, and so why, you know, so that's when the podcast came into play. I said, well, man, I need to start sharing about something t- to do something here. These people show up, man. They show up. I, I got to, they, they just show up. You'll think you, you've got to find somebody to help and, and they're there to help you anyway. Hell, you're not there to help anybody. And uh, so it, it um, but when I listened to your podcast, you got me going because you, you had, you had figured out how to do the, to, to get the bridge there. You build a bridge between you've got people on your group that have never been to AA. Never. Yeah, for sure. And they got and good I'm sobriety. Totally cool with that. Yes. Beautiful sobriety. You know, and that was a huge pivotal point for me in my recovery too, was because I was always obsessed with self-help, personal development, like Tony Robbins was the first super famous life coach, right? And I had followed him from the time I was a young teenager. So I was always kind of in that world of self-help. And there was a certain point that I was sitting in AA that it clicked. I was like, well, damn, I'm learning all of these life lessons here, right? But this isn't the only place to learn life lessons, you know, like you can learn all of this stuff, not sitting in the rooms of AA, like that's possible too. And that was the thing for me where that pivotal moment of like, oh my gosh, we really could be helping so many more people if they didn't feel like they had to come in these rooms, because there's so many people that just don't want to be a part of those rooms. I don't care if somebody wants to go to AA or don't go to AA. I really don't care. It doesn't matter to me at all. I want you to do something rather than doing nothing. I want you to have guidance. I want you to have true information. I want you to have the tools to figure out your path. I just happen to learn those things in that room. Yeah, me too. I learned, I learned a lot of stuff in AA. I still use some of that stuff today. Um, Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the one-liners as much as the one-liners drove me crazy. Oh man. I love those things now (laughs) because it's like shorthand, you know, you can convey an entire thought process in a, in a single line of words, one day at a time, my friend, Mm -hmm. you know, like if, once you understand that concept, you can just hear that phrase and go, okay, let me chill out. Let me chill out for a second. It's, it's, yeah, it's, there's a lot of stigma attached to it too, right? For people. For sure. And there's a lot of yeah. stigma attached to addiction. Uh, the the sure. fact is, is that people, oh, there are many people that get addicted and they just grow out of it. They, they never know mm-hmm. about AA. They don't know about mm-hmm. any of these other things. They just drink or do drugs like crazy for 10 years. And their, you know, their life falls apart and then they regroup. Something happens. Always right. something happens. Something happens. So it's a part of the process. You know, I still believe, and I say this, my addiction was the best thing that ever happened to me as for being a human being. I'm, I'm grateful no for it. Question. Yes. If I wouldn't have, have been addicted to or had that addictive personality to the point where it was almost utter collapse. I would have never taken the time to look inside. 
and to That's do right. the and, and to take a, a different view of my journey from the inside out not not what was happening around me but what's on, what's going on inside of me these things my life manifests inside of me and in out pictures around me so these things that you know depend upon my thoughts i, I can i can give you an example one day i'm like you know so your thoughts create your reality right so i'm riding to work and I, I live, I've lived, in some, I usually live where it's heavy, heavy traffic, big metropolitan areas. And so I got to work and I was like, okay, I'm riding to work. I'm crazy as hell all the time. Right. I'm going to just going to calm out. I'm going to chill out. So I stop back. I'm five miles over the speed limit. I sit there. I'm taking it easy. Next thing you know, Angel, I'm looking around. Everybody's spaced out around me. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. And then all of a sudden you've got a pod of like thinkers that are coming through from the back that are driving crazy as hell and they barrel through everybody else. So those are different thought pods. I see, you know, these are people that are, that are thinking on the same wavelength. So it's like people that you manifest in your life. These people are on your wavelength and then they come in and, and they go and, and they come and they go and they, you know, you make these choices and you, the, the ever unfoldingness of me is just something that's crazy as hell, man. Like I, I, I'm amazed all the time at the things that I can sit back and just relax and, and learn about myself. Um, I have always had that desire to grow and to be a better person. Yes. And you do too. You do too. Yeah. I mean, I don't see how you, but do I it. didn't until I got sober. I, didn't I, didn't, I wasn't like that until my recovery oh my. and that I, I still resonate with what you're saying. I mean, really being an alcoholic was the best thing that ever happened to me. There's no question because it led me to my true purpose and journey. Right. And I would have never, I wouldn't have had that experience had I not. And listen, does that mean it was all fun? Of course not. There was a lot of tragedy and heartbreak and disappointment and a lot of tears and sadness and despair. I mean, you know, alcoholism is a monster. It really is. Mm -hmm. But I'm so grateful for all those moments because it brought me to the thing that ultimately allowed me, yeah, to become me, right? And to understand me and find me. I got, I never had that before. You know, I drank for 36 years or so. I'm mean, not 36 years, but until I was 36 or so. And so Ron told me, he said, you know, he said, you know, he says, I, I'm walking in one day, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm working whatever the steps, right? I never did anything really. Uh, it was the process. You're looking to do something right. And then develop something about yourself to another human to get some humility in your life. For God's sakes, it's about humility and, uh, you know, knowing about humility. And so uh, Ron says, what step are you on? I says, I'm on night step, buddy. I'm sober like, you know, four months or something like this. You know, he says, you're on step two. I said, bullshit. I'm not on step two. He says, go to 12 at the page, whatever it was in the 12 and 12. And it's then the third paragraph or something. He says, now we, come to the intellectually self-sufficient man, <laughs> you <laughs> bastard. <laughs> but yeah, always had humor. He always taught me to, to laugh about things. You've got to laugh. You got to find some humor in something um, where it's going to be, it's going to be a hard life for you. If you can't laugh at yourself. Yeah. You got to get a little past the tragedy before you can laugh at yourself. <laughs> oh yeah. It's all. And the thing about trauma is it, it, it's, it's different to every you know, different people. I mean, yeah. something that's traumatic to someone else is not traumatic to me. And, and so it's so individual. Um, we're watching this movie, this series called dope sick with Michael Keaton, which is very interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of stereotyping there too. Right. Um, but it, it just goes to show you just how addiction and trauma and the lack of being able to having basic coping skills is rampant in, in yeah. the world. It is the world. the world. That's something that I really love for people with addiction to understand too, because, you know, I, I'm a life coach. Like I've always worked with people with addiction, but I've also always worked with people without addiction. You know, I mean, I work with people in a lot of different stuff. And I'm telling you, non-addicted people 
are no less screwed up than addicted people. We all have struggles. We all have traumas. Like there's no way to live life and not have some bad habits and some thinking errors and some, as AA calls them, character defects, you know, which is selfishness and self-centeredness, all that stuff. There's no way to be a human and not have that stuff and to live life and have the pain that comes with life and the disappointment and the turmoil and the overwhelm, all of those are life things. They're not addiction things. No, they are not. Everybody struggles with so much of the same stuff And that lack of coping skills is across the board. That's not specific to addicts. That is across the board. People lack coping skills. They lack communication skills. I think most people are codependent on some level and have some bad habits with that, right? But none of these things are specific to alcoholism and addiction. This is specific to the human condition. That's the, that's the, that's the thing that gets me sometimes too, is that, you know, sometimes when you're, you're, you're attached to a group, you become, you know, your, your identification is with a group. It's not, and you lose your self-identification with that. You know, in other words, if I'm, if I'm in with like a group of, they say people that call themselves addicts, sometimes I have an issue with that because I mean, that's a label that has an energy associated with it um, that, that, that affects me and affects those around me, whether I believe it or not, you know, but depending upon what I believe on there. Uh, Mm -hmm. So not becoming part of the group identification is the tough one uh, for me because you, you, in a way, does it, does it not, create a codependency to believe that you're part of this group that's has some predisposition or some weakness that, you know, you know, so we've got a little pot of human beings that are weak and, you know, less, uh, control. They can't take, you can't get their shit together, you know? So that has an energy signature to it. So how Mm -hmm. does that not, how does that not affect me if I allow it? Right. So those are the things that I think that I see as a, a big, bigger picture is that we, we group up in all these different special groups and we forget about the one group. That's the damn human group. Yeah. You know, and we, we've got the pods of the Baptist. We got the, we got all these different belief pods and, and, and they all have their own energy associated with them. Right. Yeah. So to me, I keep it out of the, I don't say, a, I don't say addiction. I don't say alcoholic. I don't do, I don't use those words i am just a person who discovered they could not drink and i want to be a better human being that's it and because you see and i use all the terms interchangeably because to me the terms are the absolute least important part of the whole thing and that's why like i'll call myself an addict when i never did drugs and people typically associate addict with drugs i've never even done drugs i'm a good old fashioned drunk right but i will identify with all the only reason i wasn't addicted to drugs is because i didn't do them <laughs> if i would have done them i would have I been did. addicted to them <laughs> so i think people get so hung up on those words and people put so much energy in trying to figure out what label fits. And this is where now we have alcohol free and gray area drinking and all of these things that I feel are largely marketing manipulation, but people get so hung up on what word am I going to use? It's like, nobody cares. Like the word is not the important part. It's exactly what you said, Curry. All you have to do is understand you can't drink. You just don't do it well. That's all. That's it. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. Like it is the least important detail of all of it. And these are my filters too, right? I mean, I've got my own filters. Yeah, to, to right, work through. right. And, and I, I, I just believe though that, that it, um, and it comes back into choice too. I right. believe there's a fine line there. I mean, you go, I mean, you, you're going down this trail. I'm watching you, you know, and you, and you're going, you got a, you're a great teacher, by the way. And thank you. You there's, it's such a, 
a balance to work out within yourself and then, and, and then the workout with like a recovery community versus a, a regular group of human beings. Um, mm-hmm. The whole point is that we are just a group of human beings. That's, that's it. You know, that's it. but you can't help but get caught up in that. I don't like the labels and the labels have my own meanings attached mm-hmm. to them. Um, I, I, it's just like a person that has an issue with smoking or someone that has an issue with eating or someone that doesn't make this. I, I don't like the special groups. Yeah. I, I just like the human component of it. You know, I just, I mean, I, I know people that, I mean, I could smoke pot. I I've done all kind. I've done it all mm-hmm. to the extreme. I like it. I, I'm an extreme person. And I, I'm going to experience something. I like it. I experience it uh, to the fullest. Um, alcohol, I believe, was just the cheapest way for me. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm not going to. There's just yeah. things I'm not going to do. I'm not going to jail. I'm not going to do yeah, that. Listen, I'm not gonna, well, I went to jail, but, but I'm lazy, right? When I think about lazy, yeah. when I think about drugs, I'm like, dude, I just not do lazy. not have. I don't have all the energy to put into all that, you know, like it's a little, it's a little too high maintenance. I knew the right people that had plenty of them. I can tell you that. (laughs) (laughs) That, Yeah. But I was lazy back then and, and I'm still intrinsically, I am lazy. That is something that I I have to battle on a regular basis. I mean, I spent the majority of my life doing nothing but laying on the couch, watching television and drinking, right? That's all I did most of my life. I enjoyed it. Just this version of me is, is just a very different version. And it's as a result of my recovery that I've gotten to get to this place. Oh yeah. The version you're on it. That's a key word. Listen, I think this has been an incredible conversation and really opening a lot of different thought processes for people to consider and in that it's not just AA or not AA and it's not just alcoholic or not alcoholic. It's not, it's, it's whatever you want it to be. I mean, that's the point is just like you said, from the very beginning, the only thing I have to understand is that I can't drink. That's all. And I have to figure out what to do to make not drinking my lifestyle (laughs) as much as drinking was my lifestyle. Okay. Curry. Favorite question, final question. What is your favorite thing about being a sober person? Discovering more about myself. My sobriety has given me back to me. You know, you'll never peel the onion back all the way. And there's so many things that I discover. And I discover these things about myself because I just don't drink anymore. And it's, it's, it's a direct result of not drinking alcohol that I'm sitting here talking to you today. That, that I'm a better human being than I was last week or yesterday. So not drinking has given me me. And there's a lot to me. I love that. That's the beautiful part. Thank you for that. And thank you for coming on and doing this with me. Thank you for having me. It's been an honor. You've reached the end of another great episode of the Addiction Unlimited podcast. Candid and honest conversation about addiction and recovery. Be sure to visit us at addictionunlimited.com to join the conversation and access show notes and links to everything we talked about. Love this episode? Please take 30 seconds to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes to help us improve and give you the information you want. Thanks for listening. See you next week.